just when you thought the human race could not get any more stupid, along comes this to prove that it can. This virus is not listening to 25,000 people in London being selfish and shallow and stupid. This virus does not listen to stupidity. This virus thrives on stupidity. This virus will find the cracks where the darkness comes through. If people don't take seriously their personal responsibility to themselves, to their families, to their neighbours and to older vulnerable people. And I would say to those people, you are going to have to look people in the eye who've lost loved ones, who've lost elderly people because of your delinquent, delinquent approach to social responsibility. It stems from the government not setting a good example, but each and every one of us has a responsibility to protect our neighbours and our friends and our elderly relatives. And you have to be able to look people in the eye in the face of funeral cortege's if this goes badly wrong. This virus may be deaf, but it's sharp and it can see where the weaknesses are. You know, this pandemic's got different phases. Earlier on, everybody was so proud of the health workers when they were going into work with no guarantee of personal protection or being tested. We've had over 500 deaths of doctors and nurses and other health care workers. I remember the government couldn't even tell us how many. The question of how those people who are demonstrating against vaccination and masks and everything, how they went from clapping to demonstrating against sensible, hygienic and vaccine, how they went through, I have no idea. It's very depressing, On the, really. I mean, it's like the Middle Ages. You've got people who are really pre-science. I think we're reaping the crop from all the cynicism about experts and science and so on now. It would be quite remarkable if all these nations who hate each other's guts had suddenly started to collaborate on a global hoax. This would be remarkable collaboration and the most stupendous kind. I mean, you know, you might say when you look at how we're running the world with global warming, with pollution of the oceans, with plastic, can human stupidity get any more? Well, yes, it can. There's no such thing as absolute freedom in this life. I can't go out on the motorway and drive my car at 100 or 120 miles an hour. Not least I can't do that if I've been drinking. There are limits to freedom. And when the country is threatened, when the community is threatened, like in the Second World War, there were restrictions on freedom. If I was a farmer in the Second World War, I couldn't just keep all the eggs and the meat and the milk for myself. I had to put it into the pool for the rationing for everybody else. That was the nature of wartime. This is wartime. There are constraints on our freedom for the benefit of everybody, including myself. My freedom ends where your nose begins. I wear my mask to protect you. You wear your mask to protect me. This is society. This is reciprocal living. We have to recognise there's no such thing as 100% freedom because that is actually anarchy. At the heart of this pandemic is exposure to the virus from one person to another through mixing intimately, either through aerosol spray from being close enough when someone's exhaling or aerosol spray or on hard surfaces, on lavatory handles, on door handles, on kitchen surfaces, and so on. Now, the less mixing people do, the less exchange of virus can take place. And we saw how that worked with the lockdown. Within two or three weeks of the lockdown, the new cases started to come down quite sharply. So that is, is what the lockdown's all about. Now, if we had had adequate testing and tracing at the beginning, I believe we wouldn't have needed to have a whole country lockdown. I think we could have done what we're trying to do now, which is have local outbreak control at a neighbourhood level, at a ward level, at a town level or at a regional level. That's what we might have been able to do if we'd invested properly in local public health at the beginning. Now, it remains to be seen whether we will need more generalised lockdown in the autumn. If we do, that twin whammy 
of the health consequences and the economic consequences will be because of the political failure to get a grip on this in March. There's no doubt about that. But now the public has to play its part despite the delinquency of the government. We have a problem of a delinquent government and we have a delinquent proportion of the population and people have to behave themselves, whether they're in government or whether they're just ordinary folk going about their daily lives. We need to commit ourselves to squashing this virus out. We need a, z a zero goal like they have in Scotland. We need that zero goal. We can't just accept this virus rumbling along as it has done during the summer and now beginning to pick up. You know, this is bad. This is bad news. It doesn't augur well for what's coming in September, October, November. We've got to really get on top of this virus. Everybody's got to play their part. Hygiene, hand washing, house hygiene, masks and spacing. Everybody has to play their part. These protests, they might have happened anyway, but I think if the government hadn't been so incompetent and so devious about the way it's created these diversionary tests, I don't think we'd have seen the numbers turning out at the weekend. But remembering, it was only about 20 or 25. It was not a massive demonstration. But I think without the government's incompetence and cynicism, it might have been a few hundred. And I think the government has played this game and it's time the government stopped playing these childish games. Childish games with the economy, which it's ruined. Childish games with the public health of the nation, which it's also put in great jeopardy. The real practical worries of the protesters have to be addressed. These worries are about personal confidentiality, about gathering personal information. And the government has created this situation from everything it's done, not least from its appalling communications, its lack of clarity, its vacillation, its U-turns, its adopting political messaging instead of public health messaging. And then what we've been hearing over the last few days is, is that with the national central testing and tracing, they wanting personal information which is being collected by a visa card company in America. That's another, yet another reason why it's so important that if personal information is required to do the contact tracing, it's done locally by people who have a face, who come from your own community, local public health director who's from the town, from the city, or known because they regularly are on the telly, on the radio, in the paper, and were people can be reassured that this is for their own benefit and is not going to be exploited for some other reason. So absolutely, this is where the breakdown of trust that's characterised this pandemic in the UK almost from the beginning is because of the reluctance of the government to be open and transparent, to play it straight with the public. And that's got to be retrieved somehow now, urgently. As we come into the autumn now and the end of furlough, this is throwing into relief the problem of large-scale unemployment that's likely to, to happen now over the next couple of months. And you can see why people on low income or people who may be going to lose their jobs really are very, very worried about this. I mean, I would be and for my, for my family, and, and I totally get it. But you cannot put investment in public health in opposition to investment in the economy. If we don't invest in public health, if we don't mobilise everybody to do the hygiene, wear the masks, do the social distancing, then we may be facing another complete shutdown again. And God knows how the economy would cope with another shutdown. We have to stop that at all costs. We have to do our bit to keep this virus under control until if we do get a vaccine, we get a vaccine. Or if we do adapt to the virus and the virus adapts to us, you know, it may take a year. World Health Organization says it may take two years for us to get used to living with each other, humans with the virus, virus with us, without killing so many people. We have to find a way of getting on um, without that toll. And people really must take that on board, that your own behaviour, your own individual contribution, taken together with everybody else's individual contribution, is what matters. What have vaccinations ever done for us? 
that's a good question. You know, when I was a child growing up, there were kids who had the long-term consequences of polio at the school with weak limbs, having to wear calipers and all of that. There were children who weren't at school because they died. We had meningitis deaths in the 1950s still. All these childhood infections, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, all these things which carried off uh, hundreds if not thousands of young children every year are largely a thing of the past. That's what vaccination has done for us. We can reduce the toll of these childhood infections to an extent through having good hygienic environments. But the blessing that's come from the vaccinations themselves has been almost magical in the way it's eliminated so many of these things in developed countries. There's still a problem in many other developing countries. And, you know, it's a challenge to the developed world to help to sort that out. You know, what we've got at the moment is two things going on, actually. We've got this scepticism about masks and about um, the vaccines and all of that. And on the other hand, we've got this mad rush to get vaccines in place before they've been properly tested, which will, if that happens and something goes wrong, it will play into the hands of the anti-vaxxer people. And the reality is that with a new vaccine, there are three stages to the testing. First one is to see if it's safe, and the second stage is to see if it works. And then the third stage is to see whether it works in practice on large numbers of people. And it's that third stage which now you know seems maybe cut short in the United States and in some other countries in Russia, um, where the danger is that sometimes with a vaccine, you can have a situation situation where the vaccine itself, if it's faulty, may result in a, a second exposure to the virus being more serious than the first exposure, which is why you've got to go through all these hoops of the testing to make sure it is safe before you vaccinate large numbers of people. And this shortcut that they're looking for is all come about because of the failure to do the basic public health, to invest in public health, to invest in the extensive testing, millions of tests a week is what we need in the UK, to invest in the local public health teams to be able to do the testing and the tracing and the support for isolating. The government needs to provide proper financial support to people on low income who may need to self-isolate so that they're not tempted to go out and about when they might be um, infectious. Then, of course, the breakdown in social solidarity that's all followed and continues to follow the uh, Dominic Cummings affair and the Durham escapade and all of that. So that really trying to get people back together in support of each other has now become really hard. But what I would say to these people And you have to remember, it's not a majority. It's maybe 10, 15, 20 percent of the population who are sceptics. But they're an important 10, 15, 20 percent because we need them on board or we need most of them on board for the public health things to work properly. What I would say to them is that if things go badly wrong now, as the schools go back and all the children are mixing again, and as the universities go back at the end of September, where we will have maybe a million youngsters traveling around the country and coming from abroad, and where we've really got to be um, confident that people will wear the masks We'll do the personal hygiene, we'll stick to the spacing, and yes, it is two metres that's that's creeping back in, people beginning to realise how important it is to do the two metres. Unless we can do that, then we've already seen over the last few days that the number of new cases each day has been going up quite sharply. It was 1,700 uh, yesterday, it was, I think, about 1,300 the day before. We could be back in the position very quickly where we're getting a doubling every uh, few days where where the deaths start again in the autumn. And I would say to those people, you are going to have to look people in the eye who've lost loved ones, who've lost elderly people because of your delinquent, delinquent approach to social responsibility. It stems from the government not setting a good example, but each and every one of us has a responsibility to protect our neighbours and our friends and our elderly relatives. And you have to be able to look people in the eye, in the face of funeral cortege, if this goes badly wrong. 
having a, a movement like this, small as it is, you know, we're talking about a very small movement in comparison with the general support that the public has shown for what needs to be done. 80% really. It's 80-20 this. And this is why the media mustn't be giving equal time to the 20%, which has been the problem in the past. When we had all the fuss about MMR 20 year, years ago, and I would find as a director of public health, I be going on television and they always insisted on having an anti-vaccination person with me as the director of public health one-to-one -one, when actually there should have been four directors of public health and one anti-vaccine person or something like that you know but this equal time is not the right thing to do with this because these people are very much in a minority i think we have to listen to them we have to be respectful they're entitled to their point of view this is a mature democracy but they can't be allowed to sub subvert the public health that's needed to protect our people. The more chaos there is, the more remote Dominic Cummings' trip to Durham seems, the more he's off the hook. This diversionary tactics, which we've seen so often. So the more diversion, the better from the point of view of these outrageous people that surround the prime minister. I see that the sensible conservative members of parliament, and there are many of them, have now started demanding a reshuffle of the cabinet. And we're going to see that pressure heat up over the next few weeks. I mean, there are some very competent members of the Conservative Party, but Boris Johnson has surrounded himself with yes men and women who won't challenge him and who by and large seem to be very lacking in competence from what we've seen in all the different areas over the last six months. So watch this space. Things will heat up. They're going to heat up almost certainly in terms of the numbers of cases, the numbers of deaths at the moment's not very high. I hope it stays low. But, you know, I'm afraid as the daily number of cases goes up, we're going to see more deaths coming through. Things are going to heat up. The economy, if we run to 3 million unemployed come November, if the school situation becomes chaotic, if the university situation becomes even more chaotic, which is highly possible, the political pressures are going to grow. And we really need mature politics with all the parliamentarians involved, not just a party that happens to have a majority of 80. We need mature government, good government, good governance, and it needs all hands to the wheel. They say in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. What we're seeing at the moment is false messiahs in the form of political leaders who have cheap, simple, crude solutions to complex problems. And people's anxieties make them vulnerable to uh, fall in behind these messianic people like Donald Trump, like Putin, like some of the other leaders at the moment that have emerged who seem to have the solutions when they don't have the solutions. And in the end, they will be exposed as bankrupt. But in the meantime, what really bothers me is the social unrest that will happen if we don't tackle things rationally, systematically, and get everybody on the same page. Because the classic fascist and totalitarian approach is to divide people, is to get people fighting each other rather than coming together. That's the only way in which a minority, you know, the fascists in Germany was only a minority, it was only 10 or 20 percent of the population. But the way in which you get a minority taking control is by dividing everybody else. And that's what we have to avoid. We need good people. We need proper leadership. We need vision, we need humility, and we need leaders who listen to the public and don't think they've got all the answers themselves. We do need faith, hope and charity at this time because people have had it tough. The kids have had it tough. The mental health of our young people, we've neglected during this. We need to do more about it. We need to have faith that we can come through this. We won't get through this if people behave in a delinquent way and don't take their responsibilities. So we need faith, we need hope, because we have to believe we can come through this and build a better future. But we need to start thinking positively about what that future might look like. And we need charity. We need to support those people now in real difficulties, people who are going to start being evicted from their flats or their houses because 
that moratorium on evictions coming to an end. We need the charity for those who are going to be in poverty, families in poverty, children in poverty. We need that charity towards the asylum seekers and all those in a desperate situation and not as fortunate as many of us. So we need faith, hope and charity and we'll get through. We've seen a lot of arguments about the news media, how they've covered this. Some have been good, others have sensationalized, gone along with propaganda. But Double Down News is one of the new kids on the block. Its commitment is only to the truth. You can support Double Down News, Patreon. This is the future. Thanks for listening.